Welcome to the Broken Pie Chart Podcast, episode 175. I'm your host, Derek Moore, and back, my long-lost semi-permanent co-host, Jay Pestricelli. Jay is the CEO and founder of Zega Financial. Jay, how are you doing today? By the way, in an even number episode, I guess 175, that's a first. I know. Well, you know, divisible by five, a nice rounded number. It's great to be here for... Uh... To be back, I apologize. I was away for so long. Where was I? Was I anywhere interesting or was I in a, a market coma? Which one was it? I don't know. Yeah, no, I don't know. One one or the other. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, when markets when markets have this, and obviously there's there's more trading, there's more, you know, a lot of our partners uh, and, and clients uh, reach out. And, and so those conversations obviously take precedence over other things. And I think some of the things we'll talk about are in the news. And a lot of these things are from conversations that you and I have been having. But first, yeah, I just have to ask, are you really cold? Because I think a crypto winter is coming. Winter is coming, Jay. Uh, what is going on there? Well, well right. I mean, uh, we're getting some new lows, not new lows, but kind of one year, two year lows on Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, it's it's definitely it's definitely feeling like like a route at this point, right? And the diamond hands are still in, right? They're holding it up, but you know, I don't know how much longer. We probably have more shakeout, right? Not that I know where where crypto's going from here, but certainly the trend tells us it's going lower. And the, but and you know what? Look, we've always talked about it as a speculative market, but the prop the problem is, and the thing that you and I talked about last weekend, or it was it was over the weekend, right? When Bitcoin went to seventeen thousand. Um, maybe it was two weeks ago, and we were talking about the potential contagion into certain Nasdaq stack, Nasdaq stocks, right? Like MicroStrategy, and not everybody realizes what happens as you know that asset drops and large companies have made investments into the crypto space, right? But you're seeing it kind of ripple through. You're seeing Nvidia sales talking about dropping because crypto mining is down right and so and they're not even holding crypto i don't think on their balance sheet like uh like others so you know there there will be this ripple effect from this asset class that is trillions of dollars i agree and and by the way i'll put a link in the show notes uh, a couple weeks ago i did a deep dive on micro strategies leverage bitcoin uh play so i'll put a link to that in the show notes yeah i, I think you mentioned contagion and and i you know look i've been a crypto skeptic. In my mind, I have yet to see anything substantial come out of that. I know we keep seeing, well, you know, blockchain will fix this, we'll fix this. So, I, but I'm the skeptic. Send me emails. But the contagion thing is interesting. And what we've found is, I think there's a few funds that that were in trouble. There's some some quote unquote stable coins. And I think what we're seeing is, what's the old Buffett thing? When only when, when the, the, tide the tide goes, goes out, out, you you see who's naked. Yeah, yeah. And I think some of this leverage stuff. Look, leverage is great until what you think you know the assets come down, and so I think that's the issue. I don't know if it's going to be relegated or, or contained just in the crypto world, but here here's my public service announcement for everybody. Okay, everybody, listen in. If a crypto, whatever it is, firm or fund, I don't, I don't even know what you call these, is offering 20% when all you can get at the bank is maybe with some of these online savings account, 1%, there's risk there, okay? You can, that's, that's the, the public service announcement, you know, the, the Friday afternoon ABC special of the week, whatever those were when we were kids. So, you know, we'll see, Jay, we'll see if there's any flow to flow through to other things. But I, I think, and I'll just say it, you know, Bitcoin and crypto has been an abject failure as an inflation hedge. I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's not, it hadn't been around the block. What? Because it's down 75%. You don't think it's doing its job? Wait, it's wait. not an inflation. Right. I, I think it's a, it's a risk asset. It's risk on risk. Yeah, off. It's a risk asset. So yep. yeah, we'll yep. see. No doubt. We'll see. Uh, but they're calling it a crypto winter and, you know, we'll see what happens there. Jay, a while ago. Oh, you, you know, it comes after winter. There's a spring. spring. <laughs> All right. So we'll By see the way, when that comes around. 
yeah, I am not saying to short Bitcoin and crypto. You are not saying to buy it. Uh, we don't, you shouldn't take any, you know, we're not giving a recommendation here. Like do, do your own homework. Is this going to be like a Game of Thrones winter where it's like seven, eight years long, right? Winter is coming. Did I, winter I take winter is coming. Start? Winter is coming, right? Winter is here. Winter is here. Yeah. Says Ned Stark. Jay, a while ago, we had talked about the S&P's worst six month starts from 1928 to uh, 2022 this year. Okay, great. And one of the things we noticed was that after the the worst starts, the worst six months. Well, actually, let me let me turn it to you. So kind of explain explain what we looked at and and what does this tell us right now, if anything? Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 a uh, quarter end. It just occurred by the time you're listening to this. Uh, and if you kind of take a look how the first six months of the market performed and compare it uh, to other years that we have data for back to 1928, I think, um, you know, it looks like it's you know, the fourth worst start to a year, right around there, fourth or fifth, depending on how we close out today, down about 20 percent. Uh, worst start since 1970. It might be the worst since 1962, but we'll see uh, where we land out. And so the thought here is, OK, we've had a real bad start to the year. What happens now? Right. If I just said cut the year in half, first half, we're down when we're down this, you know, this double digit magnitude what typically happens afterwards. And I think where you want me to go here is just kind of rattle off a little bit about what happens in the six months following uh, a material decline in the first six months. And if you look at really what I'll say, the ones that are kind of most comparable, say like 1970, where we were down 21%, the rest of the year was up 26%. So some green arrows. If you look at 1962, which is down 23%, the rest of the year was up 15%. When you look at the worst year on history, 1932, Great Depression era, down 45% the first half of the year, ouch. Uh, the rest of the year was up 56%. When you look at 1939, down 17%, the market was up 14%. And we'll publish this. Uh, we'll put it out on our blog, and Derek, you could link to it. So what we're getting at here um, is that while this, you know, history is certainly not an accurate predictor of future returns, it does tell us that when you have moves like to this extent um, in the past, uh, you can tend to get a rebound, a rebound of double digits. And so not that we're calling the bottom right here, it might not be it, but, uh, you know, between, you know, the end of June, beginning of July to the end of December, historically, when you're down 20% in the market, we've seen the decent sized rebounds after that. I think it also speaks to, look, I mean, we, we don't know when earnings estimates will change. They could go up, they could go down, they could stay the same. But one of the things that people were, quote unquote, complaining about towards the end of the year was, look, the S&P was trading at right around three times you know, price to sales. It was trading, what was it, 21 times forward uh, EPS earnings per share estimates. Uh, from all accounts, I mean, the S&P is right around 16 times forward estimates, which is technically below the, what is it, the 25-year the median, right? Or the average? It's like 16. The average, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, to me, th this says, I mean, well, really one of the questions is, does the earnings story hold up? But it's, and I don't want to use an old term from the 80s, but, you know, if you liked it here, you love it even better if it goes down. Don't you think, though, that's that's one of the reasons why typically if, if you have the first six months that are down, you do get a little bit of re a relief rally because things on a valuation basis are just cheaper, right? I mean, that's if nothing else, that's one of the things. Well, you know, you, you bring up an interesting point, right? You just made an assumption that earnings were what they were, right? Which is, I think, part of the unknown here, right? Because like, we don't know if this is the bottom or not. Is this going to be a you know, 35% sell off, is it going to be a 20% sell off? So not, and then this is not meant to be, you know, to throw water on that, but, you know, we don't know what the impact will be to earnings. If you're going to use a fundamental data point like PE ratios, then you got to know what the E is, right? You see the P, we don't know the E, the earnings on, on companies. And so I think that's where there's a, quite a bit of uncertainty around the next three months here, or even to the end of the year, 
uh, as to, you know, maybe we're not at 16, Derek. Maybe we're at 18 still and we've got a ways to go to get back to the 16. A little bit of, uh, you know, we don't we don't know for sure yet, right? Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think uh, one – somebody was posting something and said uh, we're still at about an estimate of 13.5% net profit margin. You know, net net is like all in, right? And yeah. that would be – that would still be – I'm not going to say historic, historic highs, but within the last 20, 25 years, that's really on the high end. And so – you know, for every dollar you sell, you're getting 13, every hundred bucks of stuff you sell, you get 13 and a half bucks of, of net profit. I think that's one of the questions. Can the profit margin stay higher? And it's sort of an interesting question because one would think, hey, at some point, there's going to be a little bit of pressure due to inflation and, and available dollars from individuals in the economy. Like so far, companies are able to pass it on to consumers. I, I will say, you know, oil is only oil companies. What are they, Jay? Are like 4% now of the S and P they'd gotten down to one and a half percent. It's a, yeah. I mean, they, they, you know, more than doubled their exposure. I thought it was three to six, but you were, whatever it is, they still make up a small percentage, but it's much more than they did, you know, two, three years ago. An interesting thing too. I took a look at Exxon and I don't know what their Q2 is going to be, but I just looked at, you know, their, their net profit margins are not crazy. I know there are some refiners that are having really good net profit margins, but Exxon's not. In fact, they had higher margins in, I think, 2007, 8, 9. Um, just, I, I'm doing this from memory. So, yeah, I think that's the question. Because if the earnings story falls apart, that would be, okay, like you said, are we really, you know, if they adjust it and we go back up to 20 times forward earnings, does the market have to come down? I don't know. And I, the other thing that we don't know yet is historically, and I have no idea what's going to happen this time, after midterm elections, the market tends to, to rally a little bit. So if this is one of those years, great. Uh, but certainly if, if you're putting money to work, I think it goes without saying, Jay, that You'd rather do it here than than January third of this year when the market was at all time high and we were at a twenty two forward PE, right? Look, uh, of of course, do I like buying the market at a twenty percent discount? Yep, for sure. Uh, would I like it if it was thirty five to buy it? Sure, right. But did I mind buying it when it was, in a, when it was an all time high? The answer was uh, no. I didn't mind because I was doing stuff that was kind of protecting me, right, along the way, right? And it was a plan for you never know when you get one of these kind of turns in the economy. But yeah, buying at a discount, it's like anything. Like we're buying the market on sale. Over time, markets recover. And heck, we just talked about data that shows that could be in as, that could be as quickly as six months to start to show some appreciation. So there you go. I think it, it goes without saying, I mean, we, we don't necessarily make predictions on the market. In fact, I'll get to some of the, the good and bad contrarian corner picks we've made in the past. Uh, but it goes without saying, I mean, we're not recommending to buy or sell the market. I mean, we, we do stand behind the idea of, of staying invested, but being hedged because you just don't know. You don't know if this is the bottom or if there's lower. You don't know if this is the end and we're going to go on a run. But what we do know is if you can control some of the risk, uh, that's going to be, in, in our opinion, you know, a, a better situation, uh, especially for those that are nearing retirement, in retirement, who still need growth. So, um, Jay, getting to the contrarian corner, though, I just had this on our list. What is aged well? What is not? I think at various points, uh, you and I, and we, we were doing this contrarian corner for a while, and we said, you know, if you wanted to be contrarian, and go against the grain right now. Like, what would you do? And one of the things I think I said, hey, maybe uh, buy emerging market value because the PE is only five. And if it just re-rates to seven, that's that's a pretty interesting. Well, that was completely wrong. That didn't work, Jay, right? <laughs> well, I, I had one that was just as wrong, right? Where I thought the commodities had peaked out a lo- earlier than they did. Oh, that's right. That's right. right? Although I'm going to get to commodities. Because they do seem to be rolling over a little bit, and they do. Copper, they they yeah, do a little bit. down, right? Um, yeah, I think. And I well, all right. So let me go through a couple of other of these. Uh, I think I had said, or we had said, you one of us uh, short tips bonds, Treasury inflation protected securities. 
the it would seem so obvious to buy those when inflation was uh, expected to go higher. And they were down close to 9% year to date, uh, I think at one point in June, because of the interest rate risk. Interest rates go up, the bond prices go down, and they were already trading at negative yield to maturity. I actually did a, a little of that on an episode, uh, I think last week. And I think, I don't think either of us expected the Fed funds futures rate, meaning, uh, let me clean that up, the implied uh, level of the Fed funds rate, it would be in a certain month. In other words, like, oh, we didn't, I don't think either of us expected the Fed funds to imply a three and a half, three and three quarters Fed funds rate for January. No, we, we thought they would take their time getting there. Right. I think yeah. we thought it would take a little longer and, and that's still on the high side and where I'm not sure where the implied is today. Right. That moves around quite a bit, but um, you're right. I think it, it got there way sooner than we thought. Yep. I think we had some other bad calls as well, but we may have just erased those from our mind. I can't remember any others. The commodities, though, is interesting um, because, Jay, I mean, that, that, seemed, that was one of the interesting things. And it happens in every market cycle. Like people have, there's inflows to the thing that already worked because it worked. And I saw a lot of people like after the big run up in commodities saying, I think it's time to add to commodities. And, you know, commodities are rolling over a little bit, Jay. Um, I have noticed that. I don't know if, I mean, look, lumber is actually cheaper than it was before the whole run up. Copper's going down and copper has a lot to do with China and, you know, their, their construction and their, their stuff. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts now on commodities. Um, well, I mean, the last month it's, they've been about, they've been down about 10% despite what energy has done, uh, right? So that is included in there uh, for some of this. And so, you know, when I look at some of the, the you know, more like commodity traded funds, which have a basket of like of everything, um, when you think about it, you know, food is up like wheat, oil is up obviously, but yet those those funds are still down. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's also partially a function of the dollar, right? You know, and the dollar's stronger, you need less dollars to buy, you know, the lumber or the copper or a barrel of oil. And when you look at a chart of the dollar, right, we're pressing up against highs that we haven't seen for, for years. And so, you know, that's another thing that you, you know, you think about the relationship of all the asset classes goes back to what we're, how you started with the crypto winter. They're all interrelated, right? So you need to have a theory on the dollar in the middle of trying to make a call on commodities, and why is the dollar going up? Why is the dollar more sought after right now than before? Because of fear of recessions in other economies, right? They are stronger than ours, yet even though we definitely have had that creep in a little bit. So, you know, when I think about commodities, you have to look kind of outside of just that, you know, one asset class, which definitely was uh, good to have in, uh, uh, you know, in a portfolio. But, uh, you know, now you got to make a call on some other things to know if that's the right asset to have. Jay, talk a little bit more about, and, and I can do this too, it, it just when the dollar goes up, what type of problems that causes, not necessarily for us, but maybe for us as, uh, you know, for exports, but just kind of what happens in, in maybe emerging markets or, or Europe or things like that. I mean, anything high level, um, I, I think that would be helpful for the listeners. Yeah, it's always a complicated relationship here, right? And I just always get back to how I started the piece a second ago, which was when the dollar goes up, it takes less dollars to buy something else. And so the price of that other thing drops. And that would, uh, you know, like in the oil, or gold is a great example, right? Hey, if the dollar goes up, it takes less dollars to buy that same bar of gold as before, right? So because it's not worth as many dollars anymore, right? Because uh, because your dollar is more powerful when you're buying it. The impact to companies is another thing that I like to talk about because now it hits earnings, right? So when you're converting back, and I think Microsoft put out a warning uh, maybe a month ago that because of the strength of the dollar, their earnings were going to be down not because of demand, but because of the currency exchange. So what will happen is, you know, for example, sales in euros, you know, don't translate to as many dollars of earnings any longer, right? The widget... You know, the, the, the software was still sold for the same price in euros, but you just when you converted it to dollars, it was less than before because the dollar is stronger than the euro. So things like that definitely uh, will impact things, like, you know, earnings. And I 
I don't recall the most recent number on the percentage of earnings generated uh, overseas for the S&P 500, but it ranges somewhere between 25 to 40 percent. And so uh, I think more recently it's been on the higher end of that, although we will see. Uh, So, you know, you're going to start to see lower earnings from U.S. large cap companies that do overseas business with a stronger dollar. Um, and so like things like that, uh, if that's where you're going, I'll, actually, I'll let you hit on the relationship with bonds and yields and what has to happen there and why the dollar is bought. But, you know, I think I think I gave you kind of a stock and commodity piece, Derek. You want to take the bond side of that? Yeah. And it, by the way, what what you're saying reminds me of, of my days hosting the uh, the market huddle back in our days at TD Ameritrade. And I had Kathy Lien. Kathy is uh, along with Boris Schlossberg. They're sort of known for their uh, their currency uh, investing and trading in currency markets. And she's written books and she was a great guest. When she came on with me, she actually came on and showed the effect to some of the top companies who have sales and buy things in other countries, but literally the effect to earnings of what happens if the dollar goes here or here. And I remember that. And she sort of walked through a masterclass of that happens. So behind the scenes, it may not be in the forefront. And you mentioned Microsoft actually mentioning it. But that act, that does matter. Uh, the other thing that matters is, is the debt markets. And recently, I listened to a, a podcast from Bloomberg uh, called the Odd Lots podcast. And there was a, an EM specialist, Jay Newman, who was on there. And he made mention of the fact, he said, look, we're already seeing some issues in emerging market countries. So far, they're smaller countries, and it doesn't diminish the the issues that they're having for them and their citizens. But Sri Lanka and Lebanon, I think Sri Lanka uh, tried to do a little bit of MMT, uh, modern monetary theory. And you know, I, I can't say that I know the intricacies of the debt stack of, of uh, Sri Lanka. But the point is, when companies, companies when countries in the emerging markets worlds, they might issue debt, but they issue it in U.S. dollars. And as their currency gets uh, goes down and gets weaker against the dollars, they need more of their own currency to make the debt payments in dollars. Like if your currency was one to one, and you're like, "Hey, I borrowed a hundred bucks in U.S. dollars." All right, cool, that's great. But now your currency loses half its value. Now you have to come up with two of your current two dollars in your currency to meet that same, let's say, you know, dollar of of interest on the debt. And there's this thing, and, and uh, Newman had mentioned this that a lot of these these countries borrow in U.S. dollars. It's thought to be safer, and in reality, it, it in a weird way it actually isn't. And so that's that's one of the dangers when the dollar gets really strong. Uh, especially, you know, where countries have to import stuff, maybe from here, or although we're, you know, net net uh, import ourselves. So that's kind of the situation there. And it's and you mentioned contagion in in sort of the the crypto world. The fear for people who who fear this stuff, and I'm not saying it's going to be a contagion thing, are that you start to see these little, you know, some countries start to have problems. I think I've heard some some things about Argentina, although it seems like Argentina's always been in trouble. But that's the thing, Jay. And a strong dollar does not help those countries. And I hope uh, that was a good little example there. Yeah, no. And so emerging markets that have U.S. debt definitely get hurt, right, to round it out. And one of the things pushing the dollar up is what? U.S. interest rates, because now U.S. bonds become more attractive. So let's say you live in Europe or you live in Japan and you want to earn 3% 3% on a two-year bond, you've got to convert your yen to dollars. So you're buying dollars right at that point. And so it, it all kind of links together when U.S. rates go up, the dollar gets stronger because U.S. dollars are more valuable. And then that also hurts the emerging market. So all of these things, I know we really got deep on this one, but again, they're all they're all linked together, right? It's, uh, that's why it's, That's the, why the markets are what they are. You know, Jay, I, uh, I want to get to what we're seeing in the bond market as far as yields, as far as the yield curve. And is the bond market telling us something that equity investors are not? Before I get there, here's a little contrarian thing. Are we sure there's still supply chain shortages and problems? Are we sure? 
Or is that just a talking point that everybody keeps repeating and they keep repeating it because everybody keeps saying it. It's like this endless circle. Like, are we sure, Jay, that there's still supply issues? What do you think? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not. Um, I've seen some recent data uh, while I was watching Bloomberg where they kind of gave a red light, yellow light, green light on a lot of the ports in the U.S. and the backlog. And I think, you know, most ports are have a green light status, whereas six months ago or even, you know, uh, a year ago, they were more like a red light status. And so, no, I think that um, I think that's starting to clear itself up. I think you've probably got a little data that you want to share on the topic. But just, you know, I'm starting to see some media leaning off it a little bit, Derek. But you're right. I still hear about, oh, supply chain. Oh, supply chain. Who did? Oh, where did I? So I had to buy something the other day and was like, nope, we don't have any of that. Oh, this, <laughs> I, you know, I don't even want to admit what it was. So I went. I went to Burger King because my son keeps telling me to try out the chicken chicken sandwich, and I don't know if Wait, you, anybody's that? ever had it. What is that? And I I don't know. He said it's good. He says it's not Popeyes, which is you know by far our favorite. Anybody that likes a crispy chicken sandwich, you got to try that. But he's like Jay, you got to Dad, you got to try one of these. He didn't call me Jay. He said Dad, and so I keep going by there, and they're like, no, we just don't have them. So there's still stuff like I don't think the port stuff has rippled through and kind of creating, you know, a cleanup of supply chains. But like, he just accepts that sometimes stuff's not available, but to, you know, people our age, like, wait a minute, it's on your menu. Why is that not something that you have? So I do think the reality is where the rubber meets the road between the consumer and the vendor or the sales, you know, or the company, there's some, still some lag there, but I think the ports are probably starting to clear up. So I took us on a tangent there, but uh, you want to share a little more data about, you know, let's say comparison of last year and this year? Yeah, we, we took a look and this is from Freight Waves and they cover uh, shipping, logistics, ports, container shipping, trucking, and, you know, who's not reading Freight Waves every day like I am? And Only they you, had buddy. a graph. Only you. Yeah. <laughs> look, I mean, it's, when you're in this, as long as we have, have been doing this, sometimes you look in places that aren't as, as obvious for info that tells you more about what's going to happen to the obvious, if that makes any sense. And I started looking at container shipping and I said, this is interesting. Uh, where are all these backlogs and why did it cost $1,000 to ship a container from Shanghai to LA and now it's 10000 and a month ago it was 8000 and now it's 12,000. It's like, oh, that's kind of interesting. That's going to matter when it matters. Uh, but what we're seeing is this is a graph number of container ships waiting off the Los Angeles Long Beach ports. And those are important because that's the main route which uh, stuff from China comes. And what we see is comparing 2021, 2022, going into, I would say, you know, July, August of last year, it rose all the way through the end of the year, continue to rise through, let's say, January. And then February, it started to come down. It's still, there's still more ships waiting off LA and, and Long Beach at this time uh, this year than there were last year at this time. But what it's saying, Jay, is, you know, we, we it's different than when CNBC went out there with a camera crew and was showing ship after ship after ship, just waiting and waiting and waiting. So, uh, people keep repeating the talking point, but I mean, the data might be telling us something different. It doesn't mean that, that we're going to see a surge again. And people always say, well, retailers start ordering for holidays way in advance. Maybe we'll start to see that surge, but I'm going to play contrarian here, Jay, and say, we're not seeing the same stuff as we did a year ago. So I, listen, I, I think you've been way ahead of the shipping story from, even before uh, the ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, or at least that kicked you off in March of 2021, right? you have definitely been on top of these numbers with, with both the warning sign and now it sounds like you're given a little like, maybe that's clearing up. I'll throw a different perspective at you to think about here, Derek, if I was trying to make an argument, which by the way, I do agree with your, your, your facts here that there are, you know, the, the number of ships waiting is definitely down. But maybe it's because there's less being produced out of China because of things like COVID lockdowns and them going into a little bit of a slowdown in their economy, right? We've heard China has had 
slowdown, right? We know a lot of it's driven by policy there from the uh, from the pandemic. But you know, maybe there's just less to ship out, Derek. And when they finally kind of come around and start to produce what they used to, I'm not sure if this this backlog doesn't tick up again. Well, and and a couple episodes ago, we were talking about Walmart and Target, and they have more inventory now than than they've had in the past. There's an inventory build. So I think for a while, all these places were like, we just got to keep ordering and hopefully one of these will come in. So they overordered. I'm simplifying things. But Jay, that's- Well, no, that's, but that's, con- that's true. I mean, Target came out and said, look, we've got too much inventory. We're going to have to put this stuff on sale and they're slashing prices to, to, you know, to make room for the stuff they have coming in. Right? I mean, that's, that happened. This brings us to maybe the bond market and inflation. And if places aren't needing to order as much, if they're going to have to put stuff on sale, I mean, the inflation now cast that I watch from the Cleveland Fed, if it comes in at this number, it would be a year over year of plus 8.67% for June. That will come out, I think, what, July 13th or July, somewhere in there. I think you're right, the 13th. Yeah. I mean, so that would be another all-time I shouldn't say all time, but the highest, another one of those, it's the highest we've seen in 40 plus years. Yeah. Cycle high and the market is not going to like it. So we, we go back and we say, when all these people were saying inflation is peaked, one of the contrarian things we said, are we sure it's peaked? Are we sure? Now, are we sure that it's peaked? Or really another question is, are we sure it hasn't peaked? Like, is June going to be the peak? And some of these ancillary signals are, we'll know when we know, right? But I think it is interesting in the bond market, Jay, both of us noticed that today, the 10-year bond was back right at even at 3%, at least last time I looked. The bonds, especially the two-year, had one of the biggest drops on a percentage basis. Uh, I think it was kind of a historic, you know, some of the volatility in the two-year yield. The two-year is back under three, but I think at one point it got to 3.4%. Now it's 2.9 something. Jay, sometimes the bond market is tells us things before the equity markets. And a lot of times the bond market is right. Jay, is the bond market telling us that rates, the expectation that rates are going to go up, 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 up even further? They're saying, wait a second, we're not seeing this. Rates have come back in. I guess we'll know a little bit more when the Fed does some stuff in July. Um, but I also think that the flatness and the inversions in the yield curve is telling us that maybe growth is slowing. That's some of the things I'm seeing. And I think the market, the bond market is making a clear statement. What do you think? You were like, I think we're in a little bit of a bizarro world, right? And it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the bond market because you're right. The fear is that I feel, I feel like I'm going to give you like a, a, like a time traveler. Uh, 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 oh gosh, now just the word just slipped my mind. Where where you have a paradox here, right? So we got a little paradox. So where the bond market uh, was going up, which was indicating that the Fed was going to raise more, but that drove fears that the Fed was going to raise us into a recession. And then it says, oh, but maybe they won't raise as much, and so now bonds are dropping, right? And stocks are acting. Really, right? You know, some days they act in concert with that, and some days others, right? So it's when things look good, hold on to your hat because it gives the Fed the runway to make things not so good. And when things look bad, like, oh, potentially the Fed's got to slow down their rate of raising and maybe they don't put us into a recession or as deep of a recession, then the market likes that. It's like it's this really weird, bizarre world where the bad news uh, could be good or bad. But good news these days feels like it's absolutely bad, and uh, at least in the short term when it comes to stocks. And so you're right. The bond market is trying to work it out. I mean, the Fed has told us they want to get to where by the end of the year? They say 3.75, at least three and a half, right, um, based on the last meeting. So that's more than here. Like it's six months when you're you know, doing episode 200, Derek, and we'll be talking about where the Fed rate is. You know, it might be you know notably higher than where it is today if they do what they say they're going to do. I think that's the trick, though, right? Is the Fed really going to do what they say they're going to do? Um, and how will you know? Does the market know better than the Fed? Perfect example of what happened this past month. I'm going to say in the in the early part of June, 
where uh, the Fed raised 75 basis points. Yet in the previous press conference, when asked, would you consider 75 basis points? Powell said 75 basis points is off the table. Right. It's, but, oh, guess what? Because of a report that came out, you know, three days earlier, it came right back on the table because CPI, again, was not decreasing. It was increasing. And so all of that being said, and I'm talking in a I know a, a, a little bit of an incoherent circle here. All of that being said, the bond market is trying to assess if the recession is coming and well, there's always a recession coming at some point, but when the recession is coming and how severe it will be. And flattening of yields does give us more of a hint that the recession is closer to happening than farther away. I mean, I, I could see a world where come February, March, April, May of next year, they are lowering. I, got, I could see that. And I could see another world where they're like, oh, no, we got we to gotta raise it a little bit. I think some of the sell-off and some of the commodities is helpful for inflation. And we haven't seen oil prices spike, you know, to 180, 190 that some people were calling for. Uh, I, I think some of the, how should I say this? Price controls don't ever work. They haven't ever worked historically. They've caused more problems and unintended consequences. So far, politicians haven't done that. There's been some talk. I think if they do that, it could actually raise inflation. But you brought up the, the recession, and here's a little contrarian thing to say. Everyone thinks we're going to be in a recession. Are we sure we are? And the reason I say that, and I've said it before on, on this program, the recession criteria for the National Bureau of Economic Research, who meets and decides when there's a recession, and a lot of times, you know, like if we're in a recession now, they'll tell us six months from now that we are in a recession. But two of the main things that they look at are real personal income, less transfers. What does that mean? It means adjust your wages adjusted for inflation, less like government handouts and payments and things like that. And then the other main thing they look at is non-farm payroll employment. Can we really have a recession if unemployment's low? And I would say based upon these criteria, and there's other ones too, there's real personal consumption expenditures industrial production, wholesale retail sales, adjusted for price changes, all that stuff. But the two main things they've said they look at, I mean, so far, we're not seeing layoffs. We're not seeing reduction in job openings. But here's, you mentioned it, are we sure earnings are going to be what analysts think they're going to be? This could always change. And I think right now, if the earnings story doesn't hold up, and if the employment story doesn't hold up, well, then things change. But so far, they have. They have. So I'm not sure if we're going to have a recession or not, even though everyone thinks we are. So the, the flip on that, Derek, is, by the way, I agree with you. I think it's going to be difficult for, to have a recession right now for some of the reasons you just mentioned. The, uh, so I'm not, I'm not in the recession camp. But I do believe uh, companies will start to behave as if we are going to have one, right? Um, I would disagree with you that there haven't been layoffs. There have been. We've seen some. Some companies, probably the most notable one is Tesla, has, has talked recently about cutting some of their management staff, right, and they're reducing some of their openings. Um, I, you know, there's some stocks like, uh, you know, Coinbase, right, that has cut a large chunk of their task force, but that's just because you know, their revenue is getting hammered because of Bitcoin, right? Again, contagion, right? Those kinds of things. But I, you know, Derek, I'm, I agree with you that the likelihood of it is low and we may not get, you know, quote unquote, the official recession, but I would definitely argue that uh, company executives are going to behave like we're in one, meaning the market has talked itself into affecting expenditures. Think about, you know, anybody that's listening to the podcast right now, I, I would guarantee that more than half of the people that are listening to this podcast have made a decision to tighten the belt somewhere in the last month on what they were planning on spending over the next six months. And uh, those kinds of things, just it just means a slowdown, right? Nobody's, hopefully nobody's lost their job. Most people haven't because unemployment is still uh, low. But people are going to change their behavior because the market is talking itself into that. And it's a little bit, again, of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, it's almost like, you know, when the rumor starts floating around that a bank is insolvent, the market sells it into oblivion and it becomes insolvent, 
right? I don't think it's that extreme. I'm not saying the market is going insolvent, but my, my point here is that, you know, the emotional reaction is what it is and it will translate itself into fiscal decisions. I think it, yeah, I would agree on that. And that, that's a good, uh, you know, saying that's a good disagreement to make, I think, because we're not going to see the CapEx changes, the capital expenditures line change in the, uh, in, you know, the income or the, uh, the cash flow statement until we see it. And we may, we may see it in, in Q2. I think that would be an interesting thing to watch, but we'll probably see it more in Q3 if they are reducing some of that, you know, Hey, we were going to, we we're going to take on this project, but why don't we just pause that for a little bit? I think you're right. There you go. And, yep. you know, crypto winter aside, and that's a, that's a whole separate thing. Yeah. I mean, there are some companies, and I think we saw JP Morgan announced they're going to uh, unfortunately lay off uh, some people in their mortgage division. Obviously when rates rise this much and most people have uh, mortgages that are less than, you know, 6%, although it's back down below that, you're probably not having a lot of refinancing. So um, I also think sometimes companies every once in a while like to, how should I say this? They, they use the ability when layoffs are more palpable, I can't even say that word, but they're, they're more accepted to do layoffs as a way of adjusting the workforce. And so there is that. Sometimes it's just, hey, this is a really easy way to do a rank force, you know, rank the workforce. And, um, but it, no, you're right. You're right. We are seeing that. And I think people's perceptions will matter here. And maybe that goes into, you know, some of the business confidence surveys, certainly consumer uh, surveys are negative right now. Oh yeah. That was garbage this week, right? Yeah, no, it was, it was really bad. So, but I, I think it's one of those things too, is we have to just follow what actually happens. And I think the earnings calls are going to be really interesting because they're going to give guidance. They're going to give forward guidance. We're going to see some things in there and we're going to see do the net profit margins. Are they holding up? So I think we're definitely going to, going to get that. Um, all right, Jay, I think we, uh, we covered mostly everything, by the way, people can get a hold of me and send me emails. If you're, if you don't like my, my, uh, contrarian take on crypto, it's Derek.more at zegafinancial.com. D E R E K dot M O O R E at C's and Zebra, E is an A, G is in George, A is an Apple. Financials up to you to spell correctly. And, you know, I think as we look at this market, and I think as we look at, uh, you know, the reduction, and, and we are in a bear market now officially. I know a couple of times we've done podcasts, and it's like, no, nope, we never close intraday less than 20. We're an official bear market. I think the good news is typically we don't know how long bear market is going to last. We don't know if this is the bottom or if there's more to go. But what we do know is that if people sort of uh, panic and, and it's it's better if you're in a hedged equity strategy because hopefully it re reduces that urge to panic. But we knew Jay, uh, we know Jay that sometimes the recovery happens in the first six months year. And if somebody is, you know, goes to cash, unfortunately, they may miss that. So, Jay, I think it's, uh, you know, one thing, and, and I'll throw it to you. It's a good reminder of why being hedged is, in, is kind of critical because it lets people stay invested, right? Yeah, um, I, I, would, I would certainly agree with that, especially if you've kind of taken your lump so far and your hedges are providing protection. You know, this is the worst time to, you know, uh, to exit those. But let's... The, the question I actually get more often, Derek, is, okay, I sold something else and, you know, or I had cash on the sidelines, you know, is this the time to buy, right? Maybe you sold out of your Coinbase stock before it was down 80% from its IPO. I don't know why I'm beating on Coinbase today. My apologies to any Coinbase fans that are listening. Welcome welcome to the, the uh, uh, you know, the skeptic crypto world, Jay. Welcome aboard. We're happy to have you. Oh, I can't, I can't join. I, I cannot fly your banner yet, my friend. <laughs> but uh, no, so with the, the question is, so when is the bottom? We don't know if you knew when the bottom was great. Of course, everybody would buy. But, you know, putting money to work in a protected way here that, you know, I don't know if there's another 15% from here down, right? 20%, right? The average bear market uh, is 35%, 
right down. So I don't know if this is going to be an average. By the way, in those averages are some pretty large declines, right? The 07 to 09, you know, was almost 60%. But anyway, an average is an average. And so, like, I don't know if that's going to continue to go. So what do you do? Um, uh, we like to put money to work in a way that has some level of protection on it, but captures a significant amount of the upside. So we, we're we still, you know, people that have cash on the sidelines or have rotated out of a different strategy, we still, you know, are in the camp of adding to hedged equity here so that with a longer time frame, right, when the market rebounds, you're already in it. You don't have to make the judgment. But if the if this decline, you know, continues and we do press uh, lower from here, you've got some level of protection on, so you're not, you know, feeling it dollar for dollar. So, yeah, I mean, you asked, you know, if I agreed with that, yes, being in this market is important. We talked about buying at a discount. It may not be the bottom, but, uh, you know, time does, or history does tell us that when you do find bottoms, the first six months capture a good chunk of the rebound. And so, you know, waiting for the all clear sign is usually too late. So here's, here's an actual recommendation. Um, with no disclaimer, I would say, uh, I don't know if you've seen Top Gun yet, but I, I, uh, my son has seen it twice and he's 11 and he wants to go see it again. Like, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I've seen it. It's good. Yeah. It was good. It's awesome. I think I don't want to ruin, you know, any storyline for anybody who hasn't seen it. I think they really did a good job at the remake. Like I could give, it gave people everything that they wanted, the nostalgia, the same sort of setup, you know, um, and then just. I think it's a movie you have to see in the movie theater. Like it was really good with the sound and everything. Yeah. All right. Where are you going with that? I'm just oh, that's the recommendation. Go see Top Gun. I thought you were going to link it to the market. <laughs> no, no, it's just a recommendation. Here, I didn't give All any right. recommendations today. That's my only one. All right, there you go. I'm pounding like, the table. So, for where it. are you going with this? Are you saying you know we're going you know Mark ten point three? And if you've seen the movie, you know what that is. Or you know what is it? I didn't know where you were going. Sorry. So uh, yes, I would fully support that recommendation uh, to go see Top Gun in the theaters. Agreed. Yeah, I have no idea what that means for AMC or I don't think Harkins is public or any of those things. I I don't have a clue. I mean, but didn't the AMC like make investments in gold recently, like something completely out of left field? Did you see I, that? You know, no. They bought I, a I, gold mine. I mean, why not? Why not? I mean, does that <laughs> surprise you from AMC? I mean, it's I, I have to look. I, I got to look at that, you know? I mean, listen, they, they really did make it through probably – the most challenging environment ever for movie theaters with the pandemic, right? So whatever it took, my hat's off to those guys. And great. So there you go. If they made it. I don't know. <laughs> I, AMC though is like, I got an email and cause I had talked about the reverse repo agreements. I did an episode on that. I'll link to that. And somebody sent me a note and said, you know, that AMC is going to like 300 because the fed is going to, call in all their loans and the hedge funds will be able to short uh naked short sell amc and i was just like i, I don't know what to tell you it's it's not what the reverse repos are and i yeah anyway there's amc is interesting i mean they they issued so much stock they closed out some debt it's that will be a case study like if you're writing a textbook in 10 years you're going to put that in there it'll be interesting i have no idea what it means to top gun i'm sure people went to the movies I don't follow the financials, but uh, I think I saw it cross the billion in global sales and global ticket sales. Which, which, by the way, tells me if they made a billion dollars. I was saying this to one of our uh, our mutual friends and and uh, and clients. Um, he was saying, you know, I hope they just call it here and they don't make another one. And I said, there's a billion reasons why they'll make another one. I think I there think it's going to come back, and uh, they'll keep the franchise going at some point. So. Uh, keep keep the trend continuing. All right, Jay, we'll leave it there. Uh, people have the recommendation. Go to the movie theater this week. It's a uh, uh, well, actually, you'll be listening. They'll be listening to this with like a day left in the holiday weekend. So you know, if you're listening <laughs> to it. Go that night. Go that night. Go the next day. Thanks again, Jay, for coming on. This is episode 175, and uh, hopefully you'll be back for uh, before 170. Uh, well, anyway, you'll be back in the coming weeks. Thanks again, Jay. Appreciate it. Right, right, and happy happy Fourth of July, everyone. Thanks, Derek. All right, we'll see everyone next week. Thanks.